Good day to you all and welcome to this 21st day of July. It is day 203 in our journey through the scriptures. Hello out there to everyone. My name is Heather and I am here with you on Sundays and we're about to do what we do every day here. We are coming together to the scriptures, not because they are life in themselves, but because they bear witness to Jesus, the source of our life. So we are gathering with people from all around the world and asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate these scriptures and help us to see Jesus and have our hearts drawn to Christ and together warm ourselves around the fire of God's love. Our readings today are 2 Kings 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles 3, and finishing with James 5. So let's jump right in. 2 Kings chapter 18 Hezekiah rules in Judah Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, began to rule over Judah in the third year of King Hosea's reign in Israel. He was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem twenty-nine years. His mother was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the pagan shrines, smashed the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. The bronze serpent was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. He revolted against the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute. He also conquered the Philistines as far distant as Gaza and its territory, from their smallest outpost to their largest walled city. During the fourth year of Hezekiah's reign, which was the seventh year of King Hosea's reign in Israel, King Shalmaneser of Assyria attacked the city of Samaria and began a siege against it. Three years later, during the sixth year of King Hezekiah's reign and the ninth year of King Hosea's reign in Israel, Samaria fell. At that time, the king of Assyria exiled the Israelites to Assyria and placed them in colonies in Hala, along the banks of the Habor River in Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, for they refused to listen to the Lord their God and obey him. Instead, they violated his covenant, all the laws that Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded them to obey. Assyria invades Judah. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them, King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have done wrong. I will pay whatever tribute money you demand, if you will only withdraw. The king of Assyria then demanded a settlement of more than eleven tons of silver and one ton of gold. To gather this amount, King Hezekiah used all the silver stored in the temple of the Lord and in the palace treasury. Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of the Lord's temple and from the outposts he had overlaid with gold, and he gave it all to the Assyrian king. Nevertheless, the king of Assyria sent his commander-in-chief, his field commander, and his chief of staff from Lachish with a huge army to confront King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The Assyrians took up a position beside the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool, near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. They summoned King Hezekiah, But the king sent these officials to meet with them, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the royal historian. Sennacherib threatens Jerusalem. Then the Assyrian king's chief of staff told them to give this message to Hezekiah. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt, 
If you lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. But perhaps you will say to me, We are trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? I'll tell you what. Strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses, if you can find that many men to ride on them. With your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops, even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers? What's more, do you think we have invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Assyrian chief of staff, Please speak to us in Aramaic, for we understand it well. Don't speak in Hebrew, for the people on the wall will hear. But Sennacherib's chief of staff replied, Do you think my master sent this message only to you and your master? He wants all the people to hear it. For when we put this city under siege, they will suffer along with you. They will be so hungry and thirsty that they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Then the chief of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew to the people on the wall, Listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you from my power. Don't let him fool you into trusting in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely rescue us. This city will never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me. Open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grapevine and fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying, The Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nation ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? What happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? And what about the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eva? Did any god rescue Samaria from my power? What god of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? But the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah had commanded them, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the royal historian, went back to Hezekiah. They tore their clothes in despair, and they went in to see the king and told him what the Assyrian chief of staff had said. Second Kings 19 Hezekiah Seeks the Lord's Help When King Hezekiah heard their report, he tore his clothes and put on burlap and went into the temple of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and the leading priests, all dressed in burlap, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, This is what King Hezekiah says. Today is a day of trouble, insults, and disgrace. It is like when a child is ready to be born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. But perhaps the Lord your God has heard the Assyrian chief of staff sent by the king to defy the living God and will punish him for his words. Oh, pray for those of us who are left. After King Hezekiah's officials delivered the king's message to Isaiah, the prophet replied, Say to your master, This is what the Lord says. Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messengers. Listen, I myself will move against him, and the king will receive a message that he is needed at home, so he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. Meanwhile, the Assyrian chief of staff left Jerusalem and went to consult the king of Assyria, 
who had left Lachish and was attacking Libna. Soon afterward, King Sennacherib received word that King Tirhaka of Ethiopia was leading an army to fight against him. Before leaving to meet the attack, he sent messengers back to Hezekiah in Jerusalem with this message. This message is for King Hezekiah of Judah. Don't let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you with promises that Jerusalem will not be captured by the king of Assyria. You know perfectly well what the kings of Assyria have done wherever they have gone. They have completely destroyed everyone who stood in their way. Why should you be any different? Have the gods of other nations rescued them, such nations as Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? My predecessors destroyed them all. What happened to the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad? What happened to the kings of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eva? After Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O Lord, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. It is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all these nations, and they have thrown the gods of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Isaiah predicts Judah's deliverance. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent this message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer about King Sennacherib of Assyria, and the Lord has spoken this word against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and laughs at you. The daughter of Jerusalem shakes her head in derision as you flee. Whom have you been defying and ridiculing? Against whom did you raise your voice? At whom did you look with such haughty eyes? It was the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have defied the Lord. You have said, With my many chariots I have conquered the highest mountains, yes, the remotest peaks of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars and its finest cypress trees. I have reached its farthest corners and explored its deepest forests. I have dug wells in many foreign lands and refreshed myself with their water. With the sole of my foot I stopped up all the rivers of Egypt. But have you not heard? I decided this long ago. Long ago I planned it. And now I am making it happen. I planned for you to crush fortified cities into heaps of rubble. That is why their people have so little power and are so frightened and confused. They are as weak as grass, as easily trampled as tender green shoots. They are like grass sprouting on a housetop, scorched before it can grow lush and tall. But I know you well, where you stay, and when you come and go. I know the way you have raged against me. And because of your raging against me and your arrogance, which I have heard for myself, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. I will make you return by the same road on which you came. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Here is the proof that what I say is true. This year you will eat only what grows up by itself, and next year you will eat what springs up from that. But in the third year you will plant crops and harvest them. You will tend vineyards and eat their fruit. And you who are left in Judah, who have escaped the ravages of the siege, will put roots down in your own soil and will grow up and flourish. For a remnant of my people will spread out from Jerusalem, a group of survivors from Mount Zion. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. And this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. 
They will not even shoot an arrow at it. They will not march outside its gates with their shields, nor build banks of earth against its walls. The king will return to his own country by the same road on which he came. He will not enter this city, says the Lord. For my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, I will defend this city and protect it. That night the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adramelech and Sherezer killed him with their swords. They then escaped to the land of Ararat, and another son, Esarhaddon, became the next king of Assyria. Second Chronicles 3 Solomon Builds the Temple So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to David, his father. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. The construction began in mid-spring during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. These are the dimensions Solomon used for the foundation of the temple of God, using the old standard of measurement. It was 90 feet long and 30 feet wide. The entry room at the front of the temple was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple, and 30 feet high. He overlaid the inside with pure gold. He paneled the main room of the temple with cypress wood, overlaid it with fine gold, and decorated it with carvings of palm trees and chains. He decorated the walls of the temple with beautiful jewels and with gold from the land of Pervam. He overlaid the beams, thresholds, walls, and doors throughout the temple with gold, and he carved figures of cherubim on the walls. He made the most holy place thirty feet wide, corresponding to the width of the temple, and thirty feet deep. He overlaid its interior with twenty-three tons of fine gold. The gold nails that were used weighed twenty ounces each. He also overlaid the walls of the upper rooms with gold. He made two figures shaped like cherubim, overlaid them with gold, and placed them in the most holy place. The total wingspan of the two cherubim standing side by side was thirty feet. One wing of the first figure was seven and a half feet long, and it touched the temple wall. The other wing, also seven and a half feet long, touched one of the wings of the second figure. In the same way, the second figure had one wing seven and a half feet long that touched the opposite wall. The other wing, also seven and a half feet long, touched the wing of the first figure. So the wingspan of the two cherubim side by side was thirty feet. They stood on their feet and faced out toward the main room of the temple. Across the entrance of the most holy place, he hung a curtain made of fine linen, decorated with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and embroidered with figures of cherubim. For the front of the temple he made two pillars that were twenty-seven feet tall, each topped by a capital extending upward another seven and a half feet. He made a network of interwoven chains and used them to decorate the tops of the pillars. He also made one hundred decorative pomegranates and attached them to the chains. Then he set up the two pillars at the entrance of the temple, one to the south of the entrance and the other to the north. He named the one on the south Jachin and the one on the north, Boaz. James chapter 5 Warning to the Rich Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away, and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded, the very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of Heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. 
patience, and endurance. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no, so that you will not sin and be condemned. The Power of Prayer Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Restore Wandering Believers My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, You can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and will bring about the forgiveness of many sins. King Sennacherib was at his door, the wolf as it were, ready to blow that house down. The ominous question Hezekiah hears is, why should you be any different? In other words, Why should you expect any other outcome than the one everyone else gets? Sennacherib had a track record. If you're looking for a track record to prove your own impending doom, you'll have no trouble finding it. Your own Sennacherib will surely show up to tell you that you're no different either. But King Sennacherib had a problem. In 2 Kings 18.5, we see that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. Instead of rolling over in defeat, as some might, Hezekiah rolled with his anointing and into the presence of the Lord. After Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed. He asked his God, the only God, the God of Israel, to listen, to bend down, to deliver. Our God is the difference maker, and he has come to make a difference in your life. He has come to live and abide in us. He enables us to face those accusations of our own personal Sennacherib, and all those that come to terrify us. Draw near to the one who has made the difference. Find your strength in him. When you hear the words, what makes you any different? Respond like Hezekiah. Place those accusations at his feet. Ask him to show you what that difference is. Once again, so that you might stand up, stand strong, and see the victory that he alone can bring. And now let's pray together. Lord, 
God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit on all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now, as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food. Now send us forth as forgiven people, healed and renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ. Amen. DailyRadioBible.com That's our home base out here on the interwebs where you are always welcome to stop on by. And thank you for all of you who have come by today to share this time together with us. You all are listening to this podcast in all sorts of different circumstances. Some of you listen to it on your commutes or when you're exercising, when you're outdoors walking, or just having a quiet time in the morning or the evening. But some of you also listen to it when you have the unexpected happen and you find yourself in the hospital, as one of our listeners recently has. So I just want to give a special shout out to Tawny, who I don't know the story, but I know that you have been spending some time in the hospital recently and have commented that you listened to the podcast while you were there. We are so glad that we have been able to be a part of that time with you and pray for your full healing and recovery. And thank you to all of you that take part in this podcast. We love it when you like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It's also great when you leave a review. That helps other people who are looking for this content to find it a little easier. We have a free monthly email newsletter. If you would like to be on that email list and receive that once a month, you can go to dailyradiobible.com and sign up for it there. As always, Hunter will be back with you again tomorrow morning. But until that time, let's go forward. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. And remember this, you are loved. <laughs>